chapter of Luke, verses 5 through 19. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen and what will be the sign that they are about to take place? He replied, watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name claiming, I am he and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines and pestilences in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison and you will be brought before kings and governors and all on account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me but not a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm, and you will win life. This ends this morning's lessons. May God add a blessing to our understanding and our living out of God's holy word. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now these are some texts to sink your teeth into. While you're chewing on them, though, we won't be able to look at them side by side and not wonder at how starkly different are the promises from the two prophets. Isaiah may be preaching just what we'd like to hear now in the wake of natural disasters and in the thick of wars around the planet. We want to hear of a new thing being created, and we'd like it to look a lot like peace and quiet. The second prophet, our Lord Jesus Christ, stirs the pot in ways that may not be what we want to hear, but ways that are impossible to ignore if we want to be any part of the new heavens and new earth to which Isaiah alludes. Folks, our role in helping to bring about God's kingdom isn't going to be easy. I often tell the residents at the Quaybog, I've been reading for you. Well, I've been reading for us a challenging book that brings to attention some of these difficulties in helping to bring about God's kingdom. I'd like very much to have a book study early next year on Robin Meyer's The Underground Church. For this morning, I find distinct crossover in what Meyer's says the church should be and what I imagine God's kingdom on earth to look like. And isn't that really what we ought to be working toward? Shouldn't the church on earth look a lot like we imagine heaven to be? When it does... Jesus tells his disciples that everyone will hate them. Jesus tells his disciples that when they follow him closely, people will even put some of them to death. But at the same time, Jesus tells them that they need not fear, for not a hair on their head will perish. Jesus, you see, believes in an eternal kingdom of God. It begins on earth, and is carried on into heaven eternally. But we work really hard to preserve our mortal lives, and just as they are, just as comfortable as we can make them, and just as comfortable as we can preserve them. 
at whatever cost. I wish I didn't believe what I just said, but it's too often true. We are afraid to give to others what we worry we might not retain for ourselves, even when we see ultimate need nearby and far away. People hunger and thirst for food and drink, and we forget that Jesus wants us to hunger and thirst for righteousness. So what does that look like? Let's begin with trust. If we want the kingdom, sometimes called the kingdom of God, to begin here on earth, we have to be willing to let God do a new thing in us. We have to trust that God has God's plan under control for us and for the whole world, for the earth and its resources, for humanity and for all the animal kingdom, for every lamb, wolf, and lion in it. Have you ever wondered what it would take for the wolf and the lamb to lie down together? Really, have you ever wondered what it would take for the wolf and the lamb to lie down together? What instinct might the lion have to push back in order for the lamb, in earlier passages, to trust that she won't be eaten? Well, in a kind of utopian world that we long for, lions and humans' instincts won't be to eat another or to protect our bodies at all costs. In God's kingdom, trust will be in God to provide and to protect. Maybe that's hard to imagine. It certainly was for the people who listened to what Jesus had to say when he first said it. Blessed are the peacemakers. Maybe one of the most subversive statements ever, right up there with blessed are the meek. To be meek and to be a peacemaker rests on our trusting God to have the last word. As the church of Jesus, we must trust that God has the last word, even when to trust so actively means that we may be persecuted for Jesus' name's sake. But we just don't want to be persecuted, do we? We just don't want to give up anything, even when Jesus asked repeatedly that we do just that. It's true of our possessions, and it is true of our sense of power and control. But trust we must. Try as we might, events like the recent typhoon and other world disasters clearly show us that we're not in charge. And we can't know about them and not hear Jesus' words. Bonnie Hollinger reminds us that one of the greatest challenges we face as Christians is to trust God no matter what in the midst of the unexplainable, the tragic, and natural disasters. As she writes in her blog this week, we want certainty in our lives. And Jesus seems to be saying in this passage in Luke, it ain't gonna happen. I would add to this one strong caveat, though. We have the certainty of God's love and redeeming grace through the one we say we follow, Jesus Christ. I sang what was a familiar song to me on Thursday night in the context of the evening jazz worship at Old South Church in Boston. We sang it this morning. You may or may not have heard the words. The whole service was devoted to the consecration of their lives and their pledges. I surrender all moved me in ways I'd not known before. Likewise, as the words and melody have drifted through my mind since then, and as I was writing this week, I found myself imagining the growth of God's kingdom. Wouldn't that kingdom look a lot like surrendering all to Jesus? Although much of what Judson Van Deventer shared in his writing that in 1896, much that might be applied to the consecration of our worldly possessions, I believe we could as easily recite these words as an anthem to our committing to the building up of God's kingdom on earth, as it is in heaven, in the building of a just and peaceful world. All to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. 
I surrender all, I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender humbly at his feet, I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me, Jesus, take me now. All to Jesus, I surrender, make me, Savior, wholly thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit, truly know that you are mine. But I wonder if we really want that kind of kingdom. Do we really? What must the lion have to struggle against? What must the wolf have to struggle against? And what do we most struggle with when we're asked to make the kingdom of God a reality? Remember, Jesus told us that it wouldn't be easy to follow him. What do we cling to for our sense of comfort and safety that is not what Jesus wants? Jesus has a lot to say about God's kingdom at various times and in various ways. Overall, we know that Jesus draws a distinction between what the kingdoms of this world look like and what God's kingdom looks like. As Robin Myers writes in the epilogue to the underground church, just imagine a church where Baptists and Catholics, Pentecostals and Unitarians, Presbyterians, Quakers, and UCC Congregationalists all show up at the food pantry with something to feed the hungry and then do not get into an argument, at least until everyone is fed. Imagine a church where following Jesus is just as important as worshiping Jesus. We're trying to discern what Jesus taught us about God is more important than arguing over what the church has taught us about Jesus. Earlier in his book, Myers quotes another favorite writer of mine, John Dominic Crossan, from his book, God and Empire, Jesus Against Rome, Then and Now. Crossan helps us to understand that when we talk about God's kingdom, it is not a question of only then and not now. It's not a question of only them and not us. He writes, not of this world could mean never on earth, but only in heaven, or always in heaven, or not now in present time, but off in the imminent or distant future, or not a matter of the exterior world, but of the interior life alone. Jesus spoils all of these possible misinterpretations by continuing with this. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered up to execution? Your soldiers hold me, Pilate, but my companions will not attack you, even to save me from death. Your Roman Empire, Pilate, is based on the injustice of violence, but my divine kingdom is based on the justice of nonviolence. Thanks to Cross in there. But hey, when we imagine the lion or the wolf to our lamb, I'm guessing we aren't thinking about Rome or about other Christians whom we would probably call brother or sister, even sometimes pained by our differences. Who do you imagine might be the wolf or lion beside whom we would find it a greater challenge to lie? Will you make your peaceful bed beside Saddam or feed the hungry Black Panther? Will you fluff the pillow of Al-Qaeda's emissary before tucking into the curve of her arms? Will you fight back the instinct to kill or be killed long enough to allow God to have the final word on safety, a comfort and assurance that lasts eternally, a comfort assurance that is not only about preserving our earthly bodies but about preserving our eternal souls? I surrender all, all to you, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Amen.